Thank you, everyone, for being here for our first Friday with a thought leader. Um, as in always, we start with a coherence moment. Alexander is with a client today, so Ms. Julie Lawtons will be bringing us through the coherence moment today. Welcome, everyone. We're so pleased you're with us today. I just would take a moment to connect with our being, with our bodies, and I'll invite you to do that by taking three deep breaths, and we won't try to do that together. I'll just ask you to find your feet and slowly inhale and even slower exhale just to come into the room. I'm smiling at you all. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Janice, I'll hand it back to you for the introduction. So I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to bring to you today our thought leader for First Friday, Heidi Gardner. She is the author of two best-selling books, including one of my absolute favorites called Smarter Collaboration, and has been named um, by Thinkers 50 as both a next generation business guru and one of the world's foremost leadership experts. Uh, CEO of Gardner & Co. and a distinguished fellow at the Harvard Law School, she is a sought after advisor for major global organizations. Heidi is a former professor at Harvard Business School and a consultant. And she's also lived and worked uh, four different continents. And with that, we bring you Heidi Gardner. Well, thank you so much, Janice, and uh, and thanks to everyone for joining today, regardless of what time it is or what time you're headed to, because um, I see there's some people in the chat who are uh, across many time zones and headed to other ones as well. We're delighted to be here with you today. We've got, um, if I'm correct in, uh, in my understanding of how this all works, we have about 15 minutes where I can share some ideas with you. Um, as Janice says, um, smarter collaboration is our topic today. It's uh, a concept, a set of ideas, a set of um, uh, empirical research initiatives um, and advisory work that I've been doing for the better part of two decades at this point. So mm -hmm. let's jump in. I'll share some ideas with you. And I know we, you know, you often reserve time for questions at the end. I'd actually say, if you've got questions at any point, um, pop them into the chat. Janice, maybe you know you and the team can help keep me honest. I'm not brilliant at, um, at doing too many things at once, so I won't be monitoring the chat. But if people have questions that you want to bring in at, uh, at any point, I am very, very open to that. I don't think it's a distraction. I think it's a dialogue. But very quickly, what are we talking about with smarter collaboration? I know that there's a misconception. When people hear the term collaboration, they go, oh, it's a soft skill. But when we're talking about smarter collaboration, it is not soft. And it's not soft in two ways. Number one, it's hard. Hard as in difficult to get right. And it's hard as in hard, quantifiable, measurable. Um, and the reason for that is when we're talking about smarter collaboration, it arises from the clash of two trends um, that have been bubbling up for quite some time. And when you put these together, you see why smarter collaboration is a business imperative. It's not a nice to have. Specialized expertise. I mean, you know, case in point, look around. All of you are specialized in a way of helping your clients, um, your colleagues bring out their best. You've developed tools and techniques and specialized expertise over the years. And that has become kind of your go-to way of operating. It doesn't mean you can't flex outside this. It certainly doesn't mean you can't constantly learn new things, but the knowledge is changing so fast around us that everyone, you and any client that you work with has got to put some boundaries around where they want to go very, very, very deep. And at the same time we are doing this, our problems are doing this, right? Our problems are increasingly characterized by this acronym VUCA, which you're probably very familiar with, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Any problem that occupies the minds of executives, 
leaders, thinkers, is probably one that, that has complexity to it. It warrants the attention of more than one kind of expert. And that's what we mean by smarter collaboration. People who bring together their specialized expertise to tackle more complex issues, problems, solutions, opportunities than any of them could do on their own. And when we think about this, you know, just pause for a minute and think about anything that we are reading about in say the news today. Um, I Yesterday I was at uh, a conference in New York City. It was a, a summit um, for general counsel hosted by The Economist. And the kinds of complex issues that general counsel were bringing up yesterday had to do with geopolitics and the effects on supply chain, inflation and the effects on you know all sorts of um, parts of their businesses, including customer demand. Um, and you have political uncertainty, not only in the US, but in, um, they said, uh, I think the economist suggested that 80% of the world's population will be affected um, quite directly by elections that are happening or have happened in this calendar year. That's a staggering number of people who are affected by political uncertainty. So just think about all of these different aspects of the world around us, or maybe much closer to home. And that's why we need to be asking ourselves, starting with the end in mind, what is it that we're trying to address and whose expertise outside of mine would be a valuable counterpoint to what I already know and what I'm passionate about and what I can do on my own. And when people operate like this, when they get outside their own ego and admit that they're not brilliant at everything that the world needs us to tackle, when they are curious and they ask people who um, have a different point of view, maybe they had a different cultural upbringing, maybe they come from a different function um, in the organization, maybe they came from a different you know, part, part of the profession and have different training. When we're curious about that, when we are open to being challenged by people who see the world differently, all kinds of very interesting things happen. And as an empirical researcher, you know, my PhD is in organizational behavior. I was at the business school at Harvard for a number of years. I'm now at the, the law school. And I take this hardcore quantitative approach, uh, really bringing science and data analytics and math behind the study of this quote unquote soft topic of collaboration. We can um, understand at an empirical level how this way of operating benefits people. So you're probably familiar, you've read in the popular press um, about uh, twins studies, right? So if you really want to know in medicine, the effect of some kind of, you know, an effect on individuals, if you can study their identical twins, somebody who has the exact same DNA copies, then you're going to know what the effects of these different outcomes are. Well, we couldn't e exactly get um, enough identical twins to study the effects of collaboration, but we got the next best thing. We have millions of data records from people all around the world. They're de-identified, so don't panic. I don't know who they are, but I know a lot about the two people I'm going to share with you right now. They are senior level people, so think sort of SVP level um, in uh, a major organization. They both work for the same company. They have many, many, many similarities in terms of their professional characteristics, their demographics. So we joke that they're twins, right? And we mapped their collaboration patterns. So if you, you might be familiar with one of these collaboration maps, I'm not sure I'll quickly explain it if you need a refresher. Every dot here represents one of their colleagues in the organization. The quote unquote twin we're studying is the one who's circled. The lines connecting them signify that they have worked together for a significant amount of time in the year that we were studying. So they were really kind of shoulder to shoulder working on the same major piece of work. And the dots are color coded um, by department or expertise area. So you see twin one has worked with, what is it, a half dozen other individuals inside the same organization for a significant amount of time. And then you look at his nearly identical twin. Right, somebody who's so similar to him, holds the same kind of role, same level of seniority, same department. And it's like, wow, he's going nuts with his collaboration. Um, is it worth it? Uh, you notice a lot of things here. There's a lot more dots. There's a lot more lines. So he's working with people who, who themselves are very deeply interconnected throughout the organization. Um, the colors suggest that he's um, collaborating with people in many different departments and areas. Well, what's the so what? Who is better off? Because clearly twin two is putting a lot of time, energy, and effort into this collaboration. 
we looked at a basket of performance indicators. Some of them were financial kinds of metrics, how well was the business growing, et cetera, profitability. And then we looked at some human outcomes, like how engaged were the teams where twin one or twin two was leading? Um, how was uh, talent retention? And compared to the performance of twin one, twin two's performance was four times higher. Right. So let me just pause there for a minute and ask you, I mean, some of you probably are like twin two. Many of you have probably coached or worked with, um, uh, you know, executives and leaders who look like twin one or twin two. What is twin two getting out of his collaboration pattern that his ostensibly very similar colleague is missing out on? Any thoughts? Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in. I'm guessing that Twin Two is getting a lot more ideas, a lot more um, resources. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are at least two things. Absolutely. So information, knowledge, market intel, um, possibly resources. So he's able to 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 know, you know, who's got some scare, uh, spare capacity that he could tap into or who knows whom. Right. So he's able to to use the connections of some of his connections to get uh, more uh, resource and 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 um, information for sure. Great. And seeing so Jonathan has put more perspectives in the chat more perspectives, really helpful, right? And more perspectives, not just from additional people who are just like twin two, but from people across the organization. So they might have a, a very different perspective. I would imagine twin two is being thought of much more frequently for uh, opportunities or collaborations that all the other dots on that chart might have. Yes. Absolutely. And so it's not just that he's sort of creating opportunities for other people. His reputation is spreading, spreading, spreading. And think about it this way. It's not just that he takes a lot of inbound calls. Because he's worked so extensively with all of these other people, they don't just know of him. They know what he's great at. And so when he gets a call and somebody rings him up and they're like, hey, twin two, can you know, can you accompany me to this client? Can you, um, you know, take on a piece of this? Can you give me insights on that? They're not the kind of calls where he sort of rolls his eyes and goes, oh, OK, I'll, you know, I'll be a good colleague and I'll do it. But it's really not, you know, in my zone. He'll be getting these inbound calls and opportunities that are totally his sweet spot because these people know what he's great at. So it's not just more, it's better opportunities too. There's the, also the piece about, there's something about twin two that makes them have this many connections. And so it's not just having the resources, it is maybe being more curious, it is maybe being more extroverted or fighting their introversion, but there's what twin two brings to this as well. Yes, I, I I am so glad that you brought up introvert extrovert. I was kind of waiting. I thought I thought maybe somebody in this group would do it. Um, if we let me give you the punchline, there is no evidence a priori that twin two is either an introvert or an extrovert. Trust me, we have tortured our data. We have thousands and thousands and thousands um, of of people whom we have tested on that scale, and when we crunch the numbers. What we see is there's absolutely no validity to a hypothesis that twin two, when we're looking at a workplace network, whom do you team up with to get stuff done, is more mm -hmm. likely to be introvert or extrovert. If um, you were asking somebody, how many people did you socialize with on a weekend, you would almost absolutely predict that twin two would have you know many, many, many more dots. But what we find, and we were curious about this, so you know, we dove into a lot of the, the research on introverts, and it turns out that one of the superpowers that introverts have, again, this is sort of in general, so bear with me, but by and large, one of the superpowers that introverts have when it comes to collaboration is listening, mm -hmm. right? They're brilliant at listening because unlike me as an extrovert who like blah, blah, blahs, I don't even know what my opinion is until it comes out of my mouth and I kind of examine the words as they're exiting my head. And I'm like, oh, that must be my point of view. And introverts, God bless, are good, good, good listeners 
which allows them to understand people around them and where they're going to be able to lean into strengths and to listen for opportunities and then connect those dots. Right. So interestingly, what we find is that when it comes to these workplace networks, um, introverts, um, and maybe it is a question of putting in that effort to do it, um, their, their listening skills will allow them to spot opportunities. Um, and then when they, they actually make those connections, it becomes incredibly powerful. Hmm. Just catching some things in the chat. We've got Grace saying twin two has the opportunity to know about himself or herself through encountering more people and perspectives, so better self-knowledge. And then Laura, twin two is engaging more people and possibly experiencing a culture of developing impact players, not just being one himself. Ooh, so a knock-on effect there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when I heard the the him her comment, I probably should have said. In our data, these two happen to be men, which is why I keep referring to them as he. It is not because yes. that there is anything inherently yeah. he about this. Um, it just happened to be the fact pattern. Um, and you know what we um, picking up on one of those comments as well, the idea that somebody can learn more about themselves by engaging with more people, I think is a, you know, it's, it's a novel. Um, I mean, trust me, I had presented this data to tens of thousands of people and it's rare that I'm surprised, but I don't think I've ever heard that one before. I absolutely mm. love that idea that encountering other people makes us more self-aware and therefore much likely, more likely to perform higher. I love that. The word that we didn't use is the big old T word, you know, not, not T for time out, but T for trust. Right? Um, there, there are two kinds of trust. You know, I call them flavors of trust, if you will, that are really essential when we're talking about smarter collaboration. And what we, what we know from our research is that both are necessary, but not sufficient. So one of them is competence trust, kind of no kidding, right? Like if you're going to open up a treasured relationship or project to somebody, you bloody well better trust that they're going to deliver high quality on time, on budget, all of that. So you trust in their capabilities and their competence. But at the same time, if you think they're a jerk, you will do everything to avoid collaborating with them. And if they're like the last person on the planet who has that kind of expertise and you have to, the way you collaborate with them is probably by like keeping them in a very small box and mediating everything, you know, intermediating everything that goes around just to prevent, you know, the, to do some damage control, right? So you have to have character trust as well as competence trust. You have to believe in somebody's integrity, that they're not going to undermine relationships. They're not going to steal your ideas or take credit for them. Right? And Twin2 has built up all of these nodes of trust because they've worked directly with him. And he has the opportunity then to amplify that because these people will probably spread his reputation and, and that halo of trust will grow larger because they will refer him to people or vouch for him and, and credentialize him in all sorts of things, right? So lots of um, ways that we can think about um, collaboration benefiting people despite the effort that it takes. But I want to, I know we're probably <laughs> coming up even on time um, as much as I'd love to keep talking about our twins, um, but I want to acknowledge the risk, right? So there is um, a potential risk that you take a look at twin two and go, holy cow, I don't know how he gets anything done, right? And overcommitment is a real thing. Um, we, um, we know that Overcommitment or over collaboration is kind of the, the opposite of smarter collaboration. It's kind of saying yes to everything um, is really um, reaching kind of epidemic proportions for a lot of people. It's actually more um, um, difficult for certain people or more prevalent for some people in organizations. I'll come back to that. But generally speaking, we know that a lot of people are feeling incredibly stretched thin. So actually, let me go back to the twins just for one second. Something that you may have noticed that we didn't highlight it, that are differences between the two diagrams are where the twins are placed vis-a-vis -vis all of the other dots. So twin one is kind of right in the middle. 
And you see that those dots aren't necessarily all that well connected with one another. He's kind of the picture of a bottleneck. Most things that happen go through twin one, right? Data requests or advice or resource, blah, blah, blah. They, twin two is the kind of person who sparks something and like kindles it and then lets the flames go and kind of steps off to the side. When we drew these pictures, we geared the algorithms to show how frequently somebody had worked together or worked with the twins in this given year. And so twin two has some dots that are really, really close to him. They've worked on multiple, multiple projects this year. But then you have this pink dot who's like way off across the pink dot and twin two have only worked together probably once the entire year, which suggests that they were really thoughtful about when they decided to engage with each other. Super intentional and deliberate. It's not just, hey, I got a team and I'm gonna check my team at everything that comes along. It's like, when do I really need to say yes to engaging with this person? And I think that that's also why Twin2 is so um, effective, such a high performer, is because he's strategic and choiceful, if that's even a word, about when he gets engaged. Right? So a couple of things to be thinking about. Root causes of overcommitment. Actually, let me ask you before we go any further. When you see people, and you don't have to admit if it's you, um, but when you see people who are stretched too thin, overcommitted, where does that come from? Not knowing how to say no. Yeah, absolutely not knowing how to say no. What? Where is the... Um, like, how hard can it be? It's a two-letter word. What 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 do you mean by not knowing? For me, it encompasses a lot. It, it, it has to do with not understanding how important it is to say no, having a value system that says, it, I should say yes as much as I can. I should be helpful. It's I'm, I'm more important if I'm needed, if, if I'm doing things for other people. Um, or, and or with other people, I think, but a lot of times it's an, it can be an over uh, orientation towards being helpful is one. Yeah. one piece of it. Mm. That's absolutely all the things you said are true. Anyone else? Putting my own value to someone, other people's judgment and appreciation. Ah, okay. Yeah, I can see that. It can be a fear of letting others down. Mm. which is super interesting, right? Um, if we unpack that one for a minute, oh, I couldn't possibly say no to you because I don't want to disappoint you. So I say yes, and then I risk disappointing you because I've got so many things on my to-do list that I can't do them all well enough, right? And so it, it really does, um, that motivation actually backfires in some cases because it's um, it's very difficult for us to, hold up all of our commitments if we've said yes too often. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some things in the chat here, Heidi. He's Julie. FOMO. I hear FOMO. Totally. Um, seeking approval from others rather than seeking self-care as mm -hmm. approval. Be Needing to be the hub that controls the risk. Ah, yeah. And to prove self-worth. So some interrelated ideas there from folks. Thank you. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, we see a number of those as well. And I, I um, added a few here. This desire to learn is kind of related to that FOMO. I don't want to miss out, but I'm super curious. And, oh, that sounds so cool. Yeah, of course. You know, how hard could it possibly be? Right? There's some, you know, old, old, old research in psychology that shows that our ability to predict how much of a burden something will be, um, our ability to predict that is poorer and poorer and poorer the further away it is. So, you know, if somebody asks me to do something six months in advance, it feels like a really small ask and I'm more likely to say yes. As the deadline approaches, I realize how big of an ask that actually was, right? And so you could be Machiavellian and make sure that if you really want somebody to do something, you ask them really far in advance and then they're locked in. But for all of us, we do have to sort of probability weight our yeses based on how far in advance it is because, you know, the, the psychology shows that um, we're unlikely to, um, to, to see the flip side. So our desire to learn might outweigh early on our, um, how realistic we are in estimating what it will take for us to, to get there. The desire to contribute, I think many of you have, um, have just hit on that. 
desire to please, desire to contribute, fear of disappointing somebody. And I'm going to put this one in here, poor leadership. Overcommitment um, in an, at an organization-wide level often stems from a few things that we have seen again and again. One is lack of prioritization from the top. People don't know, people say yes to everything because they don't know what they can say no to. They don't understand what's high priority, what moves the needle, what is, you know, what is my role in accomplishing the organizational objectives. Um, and if I don't know that, it means that everything is fair game and everything's important, which can't possibly be true. But let me let you in on um, kind of the, the, the last piece I will mention here when it comes to poor leadership. There is um, in our book, Smarter Collaboration, the, the last segment of it, much of it is devoted to the how-tos, how to do it better when it comes to um, you know, hiring new people in a post-merger situation, how to get incentives right, how to create true leadership around this. But we devote some of the book at the end to the traps and some of the problems with collaboration and overcommitment is one of them. And there's another chapter we call the illusion of inclusion. Right? And poor leadership comes in here, tying these two ideas together. Often with the best of intent, people will kind of look around the table, either actually or metaphorically, look, you know, look across the Zoom screen perhaps, and notice that we're missing somebody like X, right? And X could be um, a, a certain function, a certain seniority level, uh, you name it. We studied this because again, I'm a nerd, uh, you know, my pointy headed number loving nerd hat on. Um, I had the best data I possibly could when I studied this across the world, looking at gender, um, because gender is one of the few demographic variables that tends to be captured most broadly and most cleanly across all kinds of organizations around the globe. So what we found is um, and bear with me. So when I talk about women in this example, we know that it extends to all kinds of other people who are underrepresented oftentimes in, in organizations. We looked at senior women. And so somebody was looking around the table and saying, hang on a second, we don't have any senior women represented here. We need to pull somebody in. So, you know, maybe they looked at Janice and say, okay, Janice, you're very senior in the organization. Let's make sure you join our group. And Janice is invited to do that. The problem is there aren't many Janices at senior levels in most organizations, you know, not all, but certainly in most public companies, it's e very easy to show that empirically. Um, the Janices of the world are quite rare. So Janice gets tapped again and again and again for every task force, project, committee, you name it. And, you know, in our research, we could show really um, compellingly that senior women tend to get peanut buttered spread just way too thin across too many different areas. And when we have um, uh, examined this data and applied it in a lot of different settings, people who are underrepresented in various organizations um, say, yes, that happens to me too. All right, so um, thinking about what it takes to overcome this, to combat this, I think is you know potentially a really interesting um, area for us to explore together. I think I'll stop sharing my my slides at this point. And and Janet, I want to take a cue from you um, how we should use our time at this place because I don't want to violate any of the 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 protocols for how you typically run this group. Do we have time to do a bit of problem solving together, or how would you like to go forward? We do. So we have a good six seven minutes in which to to dive in. Fantastic. Let's zero in on people who are feeling overcommitted or overstretched. Maybe that's you, right? So maybe you're looking in the mirror and giving, you know, your favorite person advice, um, you. Maybe it is, you know, somebody that you're working with, somebody that you're coaching with, or, you know, giving advice to. What do you think are the most important action steps that people can take if they are either feeling or actually, you know, genuinely very over committed. So one of the things that we do internally and, uh, and perhaps obviously share with our clients is the, the thinking and the knowledge that it takes a team. Mm -hmm. So to share that over commitment and or share opportunities, et cetera, with the team, as opposed to just thinking everything is just individual, individual, individual. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Janice, to compliment that, you know, we often ask people to start with the end in mind mm -hmm. and then unpack it, you know, sort of decompose it and say, whose expertise aside from mine could really add some novelty here? You know, we're trying to do something innovative. Who's going to challenge my thinking? Whose expertise or cultural background, you name it. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a cohort factor. If I turn to, to one of my kids who are college age now, what would they say that would challenge my thinking? And if you start with the end in mind, it's oftentimes easier to understand why a collaborative effort will add value. Exactly. And sticking with that, what team in the organization can bring that yeah. as well? Yeah. 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 Uh, Heidi, I'm going to bring up something I noticed in the picture is thinking about rewards and compensation. It was fascinating to me looking at the picture of twin two and asking myself, were those four dollar signs all down to them? Or how are the other people rewarded for that collaboration and that generation of, of wealth, if you will? So if people perceive I'm going to get either tangible or intangible compensation for my participation, they're gonna be much more likely to step in how do we make it clear what is and isn't at play? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'd, I'd broaden that. I agree with you 100%. So I'm kind of yes anding you. Yes, compensation um, is absolutely essential if people feel like they are giving something up, you know, time, energy, resources, you name it, and don't get financially rewarded for it. It will be a big barrier. And I would add, that the non-financial rewards are really vital. I was just um, immediately before this um, uh, on the phone with a senior leadership team from uh, a biotech company. And you know they're going above and beyond this particular group to help embed collaboration um, much more deeply and organically across different functions and, and R&D and so forth. And they all know very well that they're not going to get bonus per se on this, but they do absolutely want to be recognized, right? And that kind of recognition, you know, what's that old commercial? Like it was a visa commercial, I think, you know, something like, you know, what money can't buy or, or something along those lines. Um, and you think about what motivates people, depending where they are in their career and their life, et cetera, um, you know, what their utility function is, if you want to use the economist words, but money might be really important to them right then, but so is learning or exposure to very senior people or, you know, a pat on the back or, you know, those kinds of things. Priceless. Yes. Priceless. That was the word Mara priceless. Um, people get used to money quickly. Yeah. There's so one great study said that, um, um, bonuses really did dramatically affect people's behaviors right up until the next paycheck. So if people were getting paid on a monthly basis and like their whatever January paycheck was gigantic because that's when they got their bonus, January, it was like whopping big change. And then February 1st, they got the next paycheck with just the salary. And it was like back to baseline. That was a very expensive month of behavior change. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so sorry, off track. Um, what else can people do if they are feeling overcommitted? Any advice or actions they can take? Heidi, your, your comment just now reminds me of an observation that I've made among our team, which is that I've started applying the love languages framework. And I see that some of them do respond to money. Some of them do respond to verbal encouragement. Some of them, you know, uh, touch is, is, is one that's hard to kind of translate in the workplace. But um, quality time and sort of direct attention from me in a virtual environment can can kind of supplant that. Yeah. So I've just found that fascinating because to your point, everyone resonates with a different kind of reward. Absolutely. Yeah. In, in a perfect world, I can choose not to um, not to over function by disciplining myself. But sometimes it's something that I cannot help in why I choose myself thin stretch when I know what value I put before even my sacrifice, knowing that that's my choice instead of that I'm dragging into that always helps 
and also kind of finding a cues. Okay, what would be a cue for me to I cannot pass over? That's having that situation not as a um like continuing um. Con continuing modern a uh, continuing pattern for me but I have a control over that that helps me always even if I know I'm stressing thin to complement what uh, Grace just said um, creating a scorecard where you have some clear plus one minus one or neutral and some questions and at least if it's you know on the high side it's a plus five yes I should be doing it even if it's even if it's a three or a two, at least you're being honest with yourself as to, okay, why do I want to do this when it's really not meeting some some boundaries that I've set? 100%, Lori. I love that idea. Um, last thing I will say is I very much encourage people, um, and forgive the sports um, phrase, but to build their bench, right? Um, oftentimes when we're overcommitted, um, it's because... We know that the thing that we're being asked to do is important, but it doesn't mean that I have to do it, right? And if we are successfully building up the bench of people who, you know, when we come off the court can sub in for us, um, that's really vital. And um, what I find I need to keep reminding people about, it's so obvious, and yet, um, is that it's a win-win-win situation, Right. The people who get to sub in, like think about how, you know, somebody coming off the bench with fresh legs to go play in the soccer game, like they're all in. They can't wait to get off the bench and get in there and play. Right. And the person who's coming off is actually oftentimes quite happy to get a sip of water and catch their breath. Right. Um, while at the same time, like the whole team benefits from the, the fresh perspective and the, you know, the abilities in there. So people who can build up that pipeline or bench um, are often able to at least um, use that subbing. Mike, I saw your hand as well. Uh, Heidi, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, question, do you have data that would enable you to uh, distinguish between the collaborative behavior of Gen Zs and older people? Ha, huh. um, Mike, I am trying to find that. Where the complication comes in, and lots of people say they have it, but here's here's why I doubt it is there's a massive confound between age cohort and seniority, right? And so there it's we don't have enough people of each age cohort in levels of seniority where they have access to resources, where they've got power, authority, da 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 And frankly, once you have those um, assets at your disposal, collaboration happens very differently, mm -hmm. right? And so... Um, the short answer is no, because we don't have enough data that allows us to do proper econometric modeling that would that would put all the controls in there. And everyone who claims that they see those differences, I'd, I'd approach it with the skeptics hat and ask, you know, what the control variables are, because I think there's a major confound in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that was a very you, dirty, dirty answer, but <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. Um, please, everyone, come off mute and give Heidi a great round of applause. We thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Heidi Fascinating. It was great. Heidi, thank you so much. And with that, it is time. So everyone just take a deep breath. This is our coherence moment. <laughs> take a deep breath. Thank you all for joining us. Enjoy your weekend. Love you all. All the best.